also my sister's birthday now that I see the date. So that reminds me, I need to make sure to call her. Um, yeah, first, thanks to our sponsors. So First Light and Argus. Uh, Greg is a, a co-founder of Argus. So just for taking the time to be here for our meeting. We sometimes have other sponsors when we have food, not today, but we will plan to do that next time we get together in person. So I always like to re review the purpose. We, we're here to learn. We're here to build relationships. Uh, along that line, always feel free to jump in with any comment, either in the chat or, or by, by voice, and get to know each other, deepen our understanding of what's possible in the world of technology and to solve specific problems. So if you've got kind of a problem you're stuck on, um, would always love to hear about it here in the meeting. Uh, for example, also Blake, uh, who's here today, had put a discussion up on the community site that um, could, you know, could be helpful for other people. And I know that we, I think we put some some ideas there, Blake, and probably need to follow up on that. So, yeah, it's, it's waiting on me for for the time being to follow up on some stuff. Cool. Yeah, good deal. But I do try to always like take notes of anything someone asks, and it almost always happens a question comes up, and you know, it's like, well. I don't know the answer to that, but we'll try to try to uh, track it down and get an answer for you. Uh, so our agenda today is we're just going to, as we always do, look at the latest features. It's only been one month since we've met, so it won't take uh, that much time to do that. And then Greg Baldini will share with us about Power BI operations, monitoring and administration at scale. Uh, so yeah, let's dive right into those new features. Um, there were a few updates made to data marts. If you're not familiar with data marts, they are Power BI provisioned uh, SQL Server databases that can be the targets for your Power Query transformations. So a really cool feature, it is only available in premium capacities or premium per user workspaces. It is also in preview, a lot of there. And, um, and if you, are on the IT side, you might want to think ahead about like, okay, what if my users are out there provisioning these SQL databases out in the environment? What does that what does that mean for my environment? Um, but it is a pretty uh, pretty cool idea for sure. Um, they did some adv some advancements that could help with query. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Does somebody have a comment and want to jump in there? No, probably. Oh not. no, sorry, sorry, Brent. That was me. Sorry about that. Yeah. Jeremy, <laughs> hey, no problem, thanks. Yeah, yeah. This is this is quite a deep blog article here, but basically, there's like a if you do direct query in your models, there is now like a parameter that you can set. You got you to look for it, but you can set this parameter on your model that will change the parallelization. It's all preview right now, and that, and they said when we GA it, we'll make it where it's more automatic. Like you won't have to go set that parameter. If you do a lot of direct query, you might want to check out this link. And by the way, these slides and this recording gets posted on YouTube and our community site. Usually, I'd like to do it by tomorrow. Sometimes it's the Monday after our meeting. So, uh, yeah, this is a cool PowerPoint, a PowerPoint integration. They kind of call it data storytelling. And actually, I have another slide on this particular feature. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, so multi-audience apps. So if you use apps to distribute your content, you now can say, hey, I want this set of users to have access to pages A, B, and C, and this set of users to only get page B, for example, and kind of have many different audiences who see subsets of a content in an app. So that's been in preview for a while. It finally did officially GA. This is one, I, I am gonna click on the link for this one because, um, this is one that people will be excited about. It's also a preview feature, but um, they were basically, you know, it's kind of something you might have thought was there for a long time. Like, oh yeah, you remember how you always have to go click on the paint roller, or maybe it's a paintbrush now, to go and find the visual properties. Well, they're working on this kind of experience where it's like, okay, right here on the object itself, I can get in context some, some of the visual properties and uh, turn them on and off easily. So <laughs> pretty much the Excel experience you've had for 40 years um, now now kind of coming <laughs> here to uh, to Power BI, hopefully. Um, but yeah, that'll be, oops, hello, Greg. That'll be a good one. Um, power back to Power Point. And apply all in a clear all slicers button. So actually it's, it was really weird because I had someone email me and say, hey, isn't there some setting in Power BI, you can like check the things you want in the slicer and then say apply. 
because they were doing direct query and it was annoying if you like every time you check a box and wait and check a box and wait. Um, and so they've had that at the slicer level for a long time where it's like you could check things and then say apply. Uh, but now they also added a button where if you're doing that for many slicers, you can like pick all of your parameters and then say apply all. So that, that way it's only going to go back and refresh the page one time. Um, Zoe Douglas, who was a leader for, for this user group until uh, last year, actually wrote that blog article because that was her feature as a product manager. So I've got to give a shout out to Zoe there too. And um, yeah, that's, that's one of the features that she's been working on as a product, uh, product owner, maybe they call it, but pretty cool. Oops. Oh, okay. So yeah, so then I guess I'm jumping right over to the next slide. They had an animated picture of what the PowerPoint integration actually looks like. What I thought was the best part of that is like that little bit of interactive experience that you get right there. They're actually in PowerPoint right here. So this is, we're looping back again. You can look at a single chart, say share, like copy the link. And then I guess there's, a, there's an add-in or something here, but basically you can paste your Power BI visual into PowerPoint slides, which I know for a lot of business analysts who do presentations, um, this could be really, really helpful because so often, you know, we're building that super cool interactive Power BI report and then we're pasting it into, we're like exporting a picture and putting it into PowerPoint, which is usually good. I mean, it makes the analyst feel happy because at least it's frozen in time and they know what's going to be on the presentation. But if you want it to also be interactive, this is pretty cool. Any, any thoughts on this, uh, this feature here? Cool, but uh, paste into PowerPoint, kind of, kind of nifty. Um, all right, great. Well, that and that, those were the main highlights. I kind of looked both at the desktop features and the uh, blog articles, and so these, those are the things I always find most important. But do keep in mind that they, all, they the blog is very active. They do a great job. They also do a, a monthly YouTube video with every release. If you want to check that out, um, when it comes to next month. It looks to me like this. Uh, there could be some interesting announcements for sure at this event. This is kind of typically their power platform. It's it is very business uh, level focused. It's not going to be a deep technology type of thing. Uh, they'll talk a lot about business use cases, and they'll have customers come and talk things like that. Um, but it's um, sometimes they also will preview some features that are that give you an idea of where they're headed for the rest of the year. So I put a link to it here and um, the date it's on April 4th and it'll be at uh, 11 o'clock central time. Nice. As far as our meetings, um, we intended to be in person this month and it just we couldn't get the logistics together uh, with Stillwater in, in, in our locations there. So, um, but we'll meet up uh, April 20th online. I've already got a, we've got a speaker lined up for that one. May 18th online, and here we actually could use a speaker. So I know there are several of you doing some very cool things with Power BI, and we would love we would love to hear from you. You don't have to be a you don't have to be a super expert or anything like that. If you just can share, here's what I've been doing with Power BI. People always people always benefit from that. So if you would reach out to me or Jeremy or Taguma, and um, to let us know about you'd be able to speak, that would be awesome. Thank you. And then we will try to get in person June in Tulsa. So Jeremy's kind of heading that one up for us to figure out the where and when. So a little, little ways off, but it's in the plan. All right, cool. Thanks, thanks so much for uh, checking out some of the new features with me. And with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker, uh, Greg Baldini. He's the co-founder and, and developer of Argus PBI. Um, Greg also has work experience being a, like a Power BI consultant for, for many years and leading dev teams. He actually also uh, was at recently at AWS uh, and, and left there before all the, any layoffs, but to, left there to, uh, to start this effort because he kind of saw this need in the marketplace. Um, I also have a personal friendship with Greg and know that he's uh, a, a lot of fun. This picture is, is business Greg. This is like weekday Greg. And he didn't know I was going to do this, but uh, if you really, once you get to know him better, then you also can get to know like Weekend Greg. 
uh, who is pictured here. So you'll see this picture on his Twitter profile and things like that. He didn't really know I was going to do that, so I hope that's okay. Um, <laughs> I'll turn it over to you, Greg. Thanks very much, Brent. I, I have oh, to yeah. say, I was sort of hoping that you would add one more animation to that to flip <laughs> the picture slowly over, I as my preferred have, arrangement is upside down. I'm sorry, I didn't do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> But I'm going to go ahead and pull up my screen. Let me know that you can see this. You should see Power BI operations monitoring and administration at scale. Yep, we got you. Yep, looks good. Awesome. So with that, uh, we're going to hop right in. I've got slides to say things about me, things about what I'm going to talk about. So we're going to dive in. This is me, another version of Weekend Greg. I've got a lot to say. If you like anything that you have to hear, if you've got any follow-up questions, I am, I guess the term is very online, so you can find me in a few places. These are my contact details. As Brent said, these slides will be shared, so don't worry about snatching these down right now. Um, you'll see these again at the end as well, if you're really eager. But again, Brent will share these slides, uh, so you'll have access to all of these. So as Brent said, I am a co-founder of Argus PBI. And as such, my boss makes me include this. Argus PBI is uh, a joint venture with Brent, actually, where we are working to simplify Power BI operations with whole tenant monitoring and reporting for operational metrics. It is a turnkey solution available for free trial and available in general uh, right now. So if you are interested in that, feel free to get in touch with us. But this is not a slide deck about Argus, although we will uh, pop back and forth to a couple of uh, demonstrations of what is possible by hitting uh, some of the backend APIs of Power BI, but I don't want this to be a commercial. This is really talking about what are the things we need to be concerned about with operations. It just so happens that I also have a company that works on Power BI operations. So today we're gonna talk about a few different things. First, we're going to cover some definitions. We're going to go over the types of things that are of interest in operations. I'm going to address uh, one question that I have heard from a few people, which is still. And then I'm going to go through some of the operational reporting and operational metrics that are useful for the Power BI administrator and a few extra ideas that I don't have uh, time to demo necessarily, but hopefully to get those creative juices flowing. And then finally, we'll have Q&A time at the end. But of course, as we're going through, please feel free to either pop onto audio and ask a question or drop questions into the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on that as we go through. And uh, really, I would absolutely enjoy any feedback, any questions uh, that you might have. Please uh, fill up that chat as much as you want. So this is very much more a conversation than just a monologue. So I've been finding myself really enjoying the metaphor of a space mission lately when talking about operations and when thinking about software and technology in general. Uh, both can be very highly complex endeavors, uh, whether that is going to space or building applications and solutions uh, with programming and with technology. But they've also got some other things in common. Uh, one of those is that people mostly show up for and care about the launch. This is the sort of thing that people will show up in Cape Canaveral for and watch the space shuttle launch. People tend not to pay as much attention or as rapt attention for things that go on during the mission. Similarly, with software, we have a tendency to prioritize and celebrate the launches of new products or new features, but there's a whole lot going on after the launch. In fact, if you look at things from a different perspective, the launch is one of the most insignificant points of the lifetime of a software product or of a space mission. We don't actually care about the launch. The launch is simply a necessary thing that has to happen before we can get the value out of it. Before we can use the solution, the solution must be launched. But the launch itself carries no value. It is the use of the solution afterward. And so that also leads into the definition of operations. And the, I'm not going to get into formal definitions or things that you might find in textbooks, but when I say operations, I simply mean the things that happen after the launch. So how do we keep the lights on? What do we do day in and day out to ensure that we are still able to get value out of the thing that has been launched, out of the software product, out of the solution? And in this specific case, how do we continue to get value out of Power BI reports as after we have launched a 
Power BI dataset, after we have launched a Power BI report, after we've published something and shared that out with the organization, what happens to that thing? Because it doesn't just go away. It doesn't stop being a concern. The things that happen after that launch, after that publish, after that sharing, that is what I mean by operations. And so if we look at the tradition of operations and systems administration in computing and technology, there have been a whole lot of things that have been essential to monitor and track uh, and just keep a general handle on as we launch systems. And this includes uh, just the compute resources themselves, racking and stacking machines in data centers, uh, keeping an eye on the storage, how much space is left on disks. Uh, monitoring logs, keeping an eye out for errors, that sort of thing, understanding what's going on day in and day out in this application. Configuration management, I'm not going to read all of these to you, but these are a lot of things that are traditional responsibilities of an operations team or of a systems administration team. And you may have noticed that I learned this trick where I can make things show up after the slide has opened. So there's even more here. After we get through those, is it alive sorts of questions on the left of, you know, is the thing just there and running? We've got a lot of other questions. What's happening? What are people doing with it? Are the things that are happening the correct things? Is anything changing over time? Is this something that we should care about? How do we know what we need to pay attention to for solutions that have been published? And how do we know at the end of the life cycle of that solution when it's time to deprecate a solution? And how do we handle that deprecation process? So there's a whole lot of stuff beyond Power BI Desktop beyond clicking Publish. And so these are some of the concerns that are traditional, but we'll get into what is specific to Power BI as we keep going. And again, please feel to drop any questions in the chat or jump onto audio. So this is the question that I've heard from a lot of people, and I will answer in the form of a reference. Does software as a service eliminate old school operations and system administration? And Betridge's Law of Headlines says that any headline that ends in a question mark can be answered with the word no. So the Power BI service gives you a few things. And this is what we get out of it being software as a service. We get high availability. Microsoft is responsible for racking and stacking those machines. They're responsible for making sure that powerbi.com returns something to you. They're responsible for making sure that you can log in and get access to your stuff, even if one of those machines happens to fall over and hurt itself or bump itself on the head. It gives you a fully managed infrastructure. So you don't need to uh, publish any, you don't need to run any servers. We don't need to manage Power BI server configuration. It gives you effectively unlimited RAM and storage. There are some caveats there and you get some notifications built in. And so if we pull back up those operational concerns that I mentioned earlier, these are things that we need to be concerned about when we're talking operations, systems administration. I've crossed out those things that Power BI just takes care of for us. You can see that the list is mostly still uh, uncrossed out. Power BI captures logs, but it doesn't do anything with those logs for you. We don't have to configure the Power BI service, but we have to configure many things in the Power BI service. For example, our data sources, uh, for example, refresh schedules or permissions to various objects in the Power BI service. So there's still a whole lot of configuration that we do have to do. Uh, resource utilization is not managed by Power BI. If we're on pro capacities or if we're on a shared capacity with pro, we don't really have to worry about CPU utilization, but there are limits imposed on how much RAM a single data set can take up. So we still need to be concerned with resource utilization. And even if we aren't aware of the CPUs that are being used when we're on a pro shared capacity, things can still slow down. So we do have to be concerned with the efficiency of our code. Microsoft doesn't handle backups for us. Uh, they do cover high availability, as I mentioned. They don't do disaster recovery though. So if something goes down or if someone makes a, a change that breaks a whole bunch of stuff, Microsoft doesn't give us a way to roll back to a known good configuration. It's up to us to make sure that we have that known good version of something that we can redeploy. Now, they do patch and deploy the Power BI service itself, and they give tooling to handle deployments of data sets and reports through the deployment pipelines, but those are fairly constrained. So there is still deployment management that we have to manage. So you can see that line is only half crossed out. As for what's happening, you know, we can we can see a lot of stuff in Power BI. 
but there's a lot there are a lot more questions than what power bi answers out of the box and as for are our data sets doing the right things? Are they giving correct answers? Or are we silently swallowing errors? Power BI doesn't tell us anything about that. And it doesn't do a good job of highlighting those things that need our attention. So Power BI is a software as a service solution, but that does not mean that we can ignore administration and operations. It means that some of those concerns are handled for us and we've got a whole lot left over that we do need to handle, but the narrative pushed not just by Microsoft, but by most big tech companies is that with software as a service, we can ignore operations. And as we can see here, there's a whole bunch of stuff that still remains a question. And so for the remainder of this presentation, I, I hope I've at least convinced you that there are operational concerns for Power BI. What I'm going to do is go through the features that are built into Power BI and how we can access this sort of information and do this work of operating Power BI with the tools that are built in, as well as showing where we can do manual checks of these sorts of things, and then also expose you to what's possible with some of the APIs to access the data that Power BI does log for us on the back end, and how we can use that to get a better and more holistic view of what's going on in the tenant. So for the remainder, we'll be popping in and out of demos and slides, and I'll be answering these questions and showing you how you can answer these questions in your own tenants. So the first question of operations is simply, what is, what exists? What are the things that have been published to my tenant? And this is a question of what's out there? What is even possible for people to use, much less what are people using? And so there are a few things that we can see in Power BI. And I'll pop over here to uh, Power BI portal. We can go to the Power BI admin portal and get a brief overview of what is published. We can see all of the workspaces that exist within a tenant. We can scroll through this list. We can ask for more than 10 at a time. And we can see every workspace that's published out there. This is your Power BI world. It, this is everywhere that things can exist in the tenant. And this is the starting point. If we don't even know what is out there, we certainly cannot operate it well. And so we can click on an individual data, uh, an individual workspace. We can click edit just to get to the name and the description here. We can also check out the access. So who is a member of that workspace? You might see a familiar name here and we can add users to those workspaces. There's not a whole lot we can do here. We can also look at the details which shows us just a list of things that exist there. So this does a decent job of starting to answer the question, what is? But we also know that there are interrelationships among all of these things. Just because we have a list of data sets and reports does not mean that that is everything we need to know about what is. So we can go to a specific workspace. And in this workspace, we can also see a lineage view. So in addition to just having the list of things that exist, we can click on view up here and we can select lineage. And with this, we can see what are the interrelationships among these objects that have been published. We can see sources on the left-hand side, data sets down the middle, and then reports and dashboards off to the right. And so we can see things that have no sources. There is a data set with the clever name data set, which has no source. It's used in two reports. We can see things where we've got uh, SQL Server sources. We can see things with web sources, anything that we're doing, uh, APIs that we're accessing, and we can see where those things are used in, in the context of this workspace. And so these are the sort of built-in things, and I've got links to the documentation and directly to these in the slides that you can reference later. But there's a whole lot more than just these views. Uh, for example, we know that things can be shared across workspaces, and having seen the things that exist does not answer who has access to those. So we can select single items and see permissions. We can select a single workspace as we saw in that workspaces view and see who's got access to it. But this is also only a, the current state. This is just a snapshot of what does exist today. It doesn't tell us what existed yesterday or what's changed since yesterday. It doesn't tell us who had permissions to something yesterday. It only tells us who has permissions today. And we have to go, if we wanted to understand that lineage, we have to go 
through each individual workspace and look at the lineage for that workspace. So behind all of this stuff, behind the workspace lineage view, behind that workspaces list is an API that Microsoft has made available that tells you what exists in your tenant. And that is the scanner API. I've linked to the documentation here, uh, but what I wanna show you instead of how to interact with an API is an idea of what can be done with that API. Because if we've got all of that information available and we are Power BI professionals, well, we have access to a tool that can allow us to visualize this sort of thing in a much more intuitive way and in a much more useful way. So with that, I'm actually going to pop over and take a look at something that we can do with the scanner API. This is a demo report. This is part of Argus, but again, this is not a commercial for Argus. This is just to show you what types of information are out there and what types of detail we can extract from the scanner API. And with this, we can see every data set, every data source, every report, and all named users, all in a single location. But not just that, we can get security lineage as well. And when I say security lineage, I mean that we can select a user over on the right-hand side here. And by selecting that user, I can see everything that user has permissions to. I don't have to go workspace by workspace and understand, oh, does this person have permissions to the reports in workspace number one? Do they have permissions to workspace number two? No, I can see for this selected user, these are all of the reports that that person has access to. There are a number of reports in a workspace named Argus Dev. Here are all of the reports. All of those reports are sourced from these data sets, also in that same workspace. And I can see behind those data sets, what are the data sources? So here I can see everything that an individual user has access to. Or if we want to go the other way, I can select sources over here on the left. So I could select a single source. And with that single source selected, I can see everywhere that source is used. For example, if we have a sensitive financial database, or if we have uh, something that we know needs to be particularly locked down, or if we're just curious, you know, how widespread is this data? I can see this source over on the left. I can see all of the workspaces it's been referenced in and all of the data sets, and then the downstream reports from those data sets, and all of the users who have permission to data that is ultimately coming out of this selected source. So there's a lot more information available through the Power BI APIs than what is shown by default in Power BI. I could, of course, go to individual workspaces here, and I could select a workspace name, and I could say, this was a workspace that we were just looking at, and I can see what users belong here, but I wouldn't be able to see every workspace that that user has permission to without a unified view as we were just looking at. So the data is all present, and you can get access to it through these built-in Power BI tools, but uh, by bringing the data to one location, we can operate Power BI. We can understand the state of the world in a much more cohesive and unified manner. And of course, when we're capturing data from the Power BI API, we can store as many copies or as much history as we want. And so you can snapshot the scanner API. There's no good way to snapshot the Power BI tenant if you go clicking through and looking at workspaces individually. But if we're calling the API, we can obviously store the results anywhere we want, whether that's on the file system, in Azure Blob Storage, or directly into a database. And then we can compare what the state of the world was yesterday and what the state of the world is today. Or we can compare what the state of the world was a year ago and what is there today. So I see a question in the chat. And again, feel free to drop anything into the chat. I'm keeping an eye on that. The question is uh, about the ETL pipeline to get that API data? And can I cover what that looks like quickly? I could certainly cover what that looks like, but it would not be quick. Uh, for that demo, for those uh, data, for that report we were just looking at, that is, as I mentioned, part of the Argus product. So there is an entire application backend that we are using to very reliably get that information and make sure that we can deal with failures of the Power BI API. Uh, if you'd like, you can ask me questions at the end, uh, just how often Power BI likes to return errors to those APIs. Uh, and I'd, I'd be happy to talk about some of the things we've learned just on the back end. But Brent has hey, also Rui. dropped a link yeah. into the chat Thanks. to Rui Romano's PBI monitor, which does show accessing some of these APIs and has a data set that can bring those in. 
So that is uh, a solution that you would have to uh, roll on your own and uh, configure yourself, but it shows uh, similar interactions with those APIs. And again, I've got links to all of the API documents, which allow you to go to uh, the Microsoft documentation site. And I'll show you very quickly how you can get started with a quick exploration with those. So if you go to the documentation site for a specific API, what we can do is, apologies, this is, that is the link to setting up the scanner API. I'm just gonna pop over to a different link really quickly. So if you're in the API documentation, and again, these links are throughout the presentation, you can get a quick feel for the API by going to the documentation, clicking on that green try it button. And I'm just clicking through to use this user. It'll ask you to set all of this stuff up, stuff up the first time you go through. But all this is, is associating the Microsoft learn.microsoft.com website with your login. And once you've got this set up the first time, you can go in here and you can actually call these APIs directly in your browser to get an understanding and a feel for uh, what goes on, how you can call these, and what the data looks like. Yes, I really, really want to use that account. So uh, once you have logged in, and that is a one-time setup, you can then see the parameters that the APIs can take. And in this case, to get the refresh history for a specific uh, for a specific data set, we need the data set ID and the group ID. So I can go into Power BI. I can go to a specific data set, a specific workspace. I can look at a specific data set. And for this one, I will use this guy. So what we need is the group ID and the data set ID. And you can grab that directly out of the URL. So if we look at the URL for any data set, once you've navigated to this data set view, you can see the URL is going to be app.powerbi.com slash groups. And then there will be a GUID, and then there will be a slash data sets and another GUID. So the first GUID is the group ID. Paste that directly into the Microsoft documentation portal. And the second GUID after data sets is the data set itself. You can copy that. And so if you want to get a feel for any of these APIs, you can come to the documentation site. Again, these are linked through the presentation. You can click Run. And then it'll show you here in the body the type of data that is returned from these APIs. So if you want to get a feel for what this data looks like and uh, just get a sample of it, you can do that directly through the documentation pages that are linked throughout uh, the presentation. There's uh, another question in the chat. Can we refresh API data sources in the service now? I've had issues with refreshing data sources based on the web connector in the past. You can. It depends on the API. The Microsoft authentication flow for all of, uh, for all of Microsoft's APIs, whether it be Power BI or the various Azure APIs, the authentication flow is not supported out of the box in Power Query. So if you were to do this in pure Power BI, there is a fair amount of infrastructure that you need to build in terms of supporting functions in Power Query. And even still, after doing that, you would need to uh, embed some credentials, either your own or an app registrations credentials. So you'd embed those secrets directly in the Power BI dataset to work with Power, with uh, the authentication workflow that is necessary for Power BI uh, or any other Azure APIs. So doing all of this directly in Power BI in Power Query is possible, but very much not recommended. For this sort of thing, you'll want to uh, use some other tool, either uh, writing code yourself in a custom backend or using something that is able to do a multi-step authentication workflow. Uh, so that is well beyond the scope of this presentation of how to build that. But the, to the question of, can we get this data in Power BI? Yes, but you probably shouldn't. Again, uh, Brent has linked to uh, Rui Romano's PBI monitor, which shows one way to do this, uh, if you'd like to configure all of that yourself. But it is, uh, it's not just the work of a couple of minutes. But you can at least get started with an understanding of what data is there and see if it's worth building out a fuller solution by doing this sort of preview in the API documentation. And so with that, I'm going to pop back into the presentation. But again, keep throwing questions into the chat. Happy to see those. 
Uh, so we were just looking at the inventory. What is, what exists, and what are the interrelationships and permissions among all of those things? That's just the starting point uh, to operate Power BI. This tells us the things that we need to worry about, but it doesn't tell us what's happening with those things. So the next question, uh, both in operations and in Power BI operations is, what's going on? What are people doing? So Power BI does have some built-in uh, capacity to be able to show you usage metrics, so report views. And they've been doing a lot of work on the report, uh, the usage metrics report. And I'll show both the old version and the new version uh, in a demo shortly and how you can get to those. Uh, but it's it's restricted to just report views. It does also include some data that's not readily available in the APIs. So this one is really uh, a mixed bag about where you can get the best answers. And I'll take a look at those in the demo and show you what's available via API and what's available in the built-in metrics reports. There are some limitations to the built-in reports. Uh, again, they're report views only, and there are many more things we can do in Power BI than look at a report. And the data retention, again, for activity, the built-in metrics reports show 30 days of activity. And again, that is uh, a limitation for that built-in solution. If you hit the API, again, you can store history for as long as you want for long-term analysis. But first, we'll look at the built-in usage metrics report. And to do the usage metrics report, we can come to Power BI, and we can go to a specific workspace. and in a workspace, if you're looking at the various reports that exist, you can select the ellipsis menu. And then under that ellipsis menu, there is an option, view usage metrics report. And this will show you usage for that specific report. If you're doing this for the first time on a, uh, on a report, it may take a little bit of time uh, before it can get you this data back. So it may spin for a little bit before it gives you the report. This is the new usage metrics report. And this shows you, again, metrics about report views and report page views. It'll tell you how many people have viewed, who those users are, and when they have accessed the reports. It'll also tell you whether they're accessing those reports via the workspace directly or through the app. Excuse me. And if they're accessing the reports from something other than powerbi.com, for example, through the mobile apps, it'll break that down under platform. We've got a list of the users who are accessing the reports under the users over here. And there's also a link to show the specific pages of the reports that have been viewed. And this specific report has a single page. So that page level information is something that's unique to the usage metrics report. There's also the report performance page. And this will tell you the typical opening time for the report. And uh, again, this is something that is available through the built-in reports that is not necessarily available through the APIs, or at least not uh, anywhere close to as readily. And you can see daily and seven-day trends of this data. And I see that you have that little flag set in the corner about the new usage report is on. Yes. So this is the okay. new experience. This is what Microsoft has been publishing recently. I believe this is still preview or just out of preview. Eventually that toggle will probably go away. And then uh, this last page, it shows you the report views across the entire workspace so that you can see uh, who's accessing what reports uh, across the entire workspace. And so you can also copy this. You can save a copy of these reports. And I've actually uh, done that already in the manner of a TV chef. So I've got one in the oven. And so what I can do is actually come to my workspace where I saved these copies. And so we were just looking at the new copy. I'm going to go to the uh, old copy first. So this is what the usage metrics looks like or has looked like up until now. Just a single page in this report showing you all of the report pages that exist in that workspace. And it shows you the views in that workspace. Again, there's the new experience, which you can get through the toggle. And I'll show that new copy here again. So this is the new workspace. These are copies, so they don't show that toggle up at the top. But one nice thing you get out of making a copy of that report is that you can expand out the filters pane and then clear the filter that is setting it to a single report at a time. And so by clearing that, you now get a 
report that shows report views for the entire workspace. Uh, but again, it will be restricted to just that workspace. So again, the way that I did that was that I started in a specific workspace. I went to the ellipsis pane and I viewed the usage metrics report. When you go directly through that ellipsis pane, you get the toggle up here for the old or the new experience, but you can also click on file and save a copy. When you save that copy, you then get a version of that report that you can put into any workspace. I put that copy here in my own workspace, and with that, what you can do is expand out the filters pane and be able to clear the report, uh, the report filter, so that you can see usage across the workspace instead of just for a single uh, report at a time. And so this is how we can get a view of usage within the Power BI portal with this built-in experience. I see a question in the chat, do we know what platform equals other is? And I do not know that off the top of my head. That is a good question, but I have no good answer for you right now. Of course, this is, as I said, the built-in experience. We also have the user audit logs or the user activity logs available via API. And I've got a link here that can that takes you to uh, an overview of how to get to Power BI user activity. And then we'll link to the appropriate APIs to call from there. So again, you can find out uh, more Microsoft guidance on this uh, through that link. But again, this is not a presentation about calling APIs. This is a presentation about operating Power BI. And so I wanna show you what it can look like if you have all of the Power BI user activity, not just report views. So. Again, uh, for this demo, I'm just showing Argus as a what is possible type of question rather than uh, that you have to do it this way. And here we've got uh, a view where we can look at just report views, but across the entire tenant instead of in just a single workspace at a time. And so we can see every individual view activity. We can see what report was viewed, what data set was viewed, what workspace they were in, as well as the capacity that lived on. And then we can also show where the user was and what they accessed, uh, where they were accessing from with browser information if that's reported by the browser. The chart at the top shows just total views uh, and unique user count. So this is fairly similar to the built-in reports. Of course, we can go across multiple workspaces at a time. So rather than just a single workspace's reports, I can select the workspaces that I'm most interested in. For example, if we keep all of our production reports in known workspaces, we can quickly filter down to just that workspace. And of course, we can filter down to individual data sets and individual reports. So we can see views across all of those levels. But like I said, there's so much more that people are doing in Power BI than just viewing reports. So at the click of a button, we can see all activities that are going on in the tenant. Now you'll see a whole bunch of this user with a GUID as a name. And that is an app registration that is actually calling these APIs. And so we can see all of the APIs that are being called. I'm just gonna unselect that user to clean this up and look at what humans are doing. Although it is interesting to see what is automated as well. And so we can see some interesting things in here. First of all, we can see that there was a big spike a little while ago. And again, we might see a familiar name there. And it was Brent actually testing uh, some data flow stuff and ended up doing much more activity than other people on the tenant on that day. But again, this is every activity, not just report views. And so we can ask questions like, who are our creators? Who are the people that are doing creation activities? And so I've selected in the activity type slicer over on the right here, everything that is a creation activity. And we can see the people that are making things. We can see people are creating data sets, reports, data marts, and we can see what are the things that they created. So if you look at the report usage metrics, that is actually creating a report when you navigate through that experience that I just showed earlier. And you can see who's doing that. You can also see who's creating gateways. So another familiar name right there was creating a gateway not too long ago on the 27th. So these are the people who are making stuff. And that's really useful because those are the people who are most likely to be your champions. And in a large environment, you might not know those individuals by name or in person. But this allows you to understand who's making stuff. Another view that you might want for understanding your makers and your authors is looking at editors. So who is doing some edit activities? 
And so again, you can quickly narrow down to see who's doing what types of activities. And you can scroll through to see all of the various activity types. And again, I mentioned the built-in solution shows only 28 days. But we, of course, can maintain as much history as we want when we're calling the APIs. We can store that in any location. And so we can go beyond 30 days, something crazy like 31 days, perhaps, or maybe a little bit longer. And we can see activity over time. We can see where we've got spikes in number of users. And we can see our most active day in terms of number of users was the 27th of January. And we can see here are the people who were doing things on that day. Now, this demo tenant is pretty small, only four unique users. But this allows us to quickly see those sorts of trends. We can see these outliers. The day Brent was experimenting. We can see another outlier uh, just a few days ago. And it looks like Brent was experimenting again. And prior to that, more Brent experimentations. So he's a curious fellow, that guy. But uh, this allows us to quickly understand who's active, who are the people who are doing things in Power BI. And if we're looking at perhaps breakages or refresh failures, if we're looking at things where people are asking questions about what changed and why, that's something where we really might want to understand who's been updating stuff and who's been editing stuff. And this will allow us to do a much better root cause analysis than just guessing or uh, just uh, just guessing or looking at the PBIX and trying to understand that history over time. So we can look at edit and update activities. And these are the people and these are the activities that might prompt different types of changes. So there's a question in the chat from Yeah, that, and that was me, Greg. I, I, wanted, I wanted to see, can you see who's exporting data? Because I feel like that happened. We have a lot of users who do that. Oh, they, you know, they, they're just exporting out to Excel rather than really using Power BI. And I also did just give, want to give a time notice that we, we have about eight minutes left in our scheduled time. Yeah, absolutely. So Thanks. Uh, we can see who's used an external application for analysis. And I believe exports are included. We just don't have any in this data set or in this demo. <laughs> I didn't think about that. We don't export. I don't export from my tenant, right? I don't do that. Right. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that now. Thank you. Got yep. it. So that's looking at user activity. What is going on? And the last piece that we want to understand is performance. So with Power BI, there are a lot of different things that can go into performance, but from an operational concern instead of a development concern, development performance is when you would be optimizing specific DAX measures or specific uh, DAX queries or specific visuals. That's something that's not so much in, in the realm of operations, but something that you're doing at development time to ensure that you've got uh, good performing queries and good performing data sets. But when we're looking at performance from an operational perspective, the one thing that we really uh, have across all of Power BI is refreshes. There is also uh, the idea of premium capacities where there are more performance metrics worth looking at. Um, but first, I want to pay attention to refresh history. So Power BI does a few things. You can get to a refresh history for a single data set. You can get notifications via email for failed refreshes. And there is a limited way to see refreshes that are happening on capacities in a unified way. This is all configured and viewable per data set for the most part. And there's only a seven day retention period here. And so to get to that in Power BI, we would go to a specific Power BI data set. So we would go to our workspace. We would navigate to a data set. And then with that data set, we can go to the scheduled refresh settings menu. And here we can see the refresh history for this particular data set. And this one shows off an interesting pattern, a little piece of trivia. If you've ever run into the situation where your Power BI refreshes, just stop for some reason, or your schedule disables itself. If you've got a scheduled refresh that fails four times in a row, that schedule just turns off. So this is an example of a data set that failed four times in a row, and its schedule just got turned off by Power BI. But we can see this history for a single data set at a time. And if we are an administrator, we can also go to the admin portal, and we can see a refresh summary for premium capacity. This will show anything on PPU, uh, premium capacity, EM SKUs, or A SKUs. But this is just going to show us our most recent refresh for each of those data sets. Again, the APIs allow us to 
collect and capture and store history over time. So a quick view of what we can do with the APIs. We can look at all refreshes across the entire tenant. And so this is every refresh that's going on. We can see individual refresh activities. We can see how long those took, their average durations. And then in the visualization, we can see the total number of refreshes that are happening and how long they're taking. We can quickly, uh, so like I said, we can go past uh, just seven days of history. We're looking at 14 days here, but we can look uh, much longer than that. Let's look at a month of refresh history and we can look for failures in there. Let's go even longer. Let's go two months of refresh history and we see what failures are happening. And with this unified view, looking for just failures, we can quickly see that which reports, which data sets have repeated failures and which ones are one-offs. And so in the last 60 days, we've got a few one-off failures, things that happened once and did not recur. And then we can see that one data set that failed four times in a row. So we can very quickly uh, jump in here and see what is failing consistently and might have a refresh schedule disabled. We can also look for the refresh durations. And so another limitation in Power BI is the refresh duration. The default timeout for pro shared capacity data sets is 120 minutes. Your data set will fail to refresh at 120 minutes, no matter how good things are going. And for premium capacities, it will time out at 300 minutes. And with the built-in alerting, with the built-in report, you'll only know after the fact that something has failed. But by being able to look at everything here, you can quickly understand what are our slowest report refreshes? What are the things that are taking a long time? And we can see that we've got a few things in the past 60 days that exceeded four and a half minutes, but not too many. And our slowest one is just 14.5 minutes. So nowhere near to the timeout and therefore not a concern. So again, by using the APIs and bringing this information into one location, we can get a much better view of what's going on across the tenant. So there are more things uh, that I didn't have demos for today, but I just wanted to put out there as some ideas, things to look at if you're on a premium capacity, and also thoughts of what you might wanna do for operational reporting and uh, operational metrics. So there is a capacity metrics uh, app that Microsoft publishes that you can look at to see how your premium capacity is performing. But one thing that you might want to do is look at data quality. So there's an execute queries API linked here. And one thing that you could do is you could get a row count for every table in every data set after their refreshes. And that would allow you to see is the data growing or does it go from you know a million records down to one after a certain refresh. So that might not show up as a refresh failure, but there could be something going on that is an issue. And you would be able to see that from an automated perspective. There's also log analytics. Again, details are linked here in the presentation, but this gives you detailed diagnostics similar to what you would get out of SQL Server or analysis services for individual queries on premium capacities. So this would allow you to an, analyze what is going slow across the entire capacity. So again, uh, being able to take a look at that data and centralize it in one location will give you a much more holistic view of your tenant, of the state of your world. Or another idea with execute queries, you could capture all of the queries on some important report pages using the performance analyzer. And then you could run those queries every day to see how those queries are running and get an idea of what the user experience is like to open that report page. Because at the end of the day, a Power BI report is simply a bunch of DAX queries that are then presented in visuals. So a lot of options, a lot of ideas, uh, and I'm sure there are more things that uh, you and the audience might want to check. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of capability hidden behind the APIs. And it's worth uh, starting to look at what tools are useful to build, what tools are useful to buy, to be able to operate Power BI better than what comes out of the box. And I'll conclude with, you know, we're Power BI developers, we're Power BI administrators. We make nice things for others, but we deserve those nice things too. And Power BI is a unique tool. Once we have data, we are very capable of visualizing that information and answering very useful questions. And we can be data-driven in our prioritization and planning. If we see something that's refreshing more slowly over time, that can be a priority for optimization. If we have user requests coming in, but then we look at that report that they're requesting changes to, and we see that one person accesses it once a month, maybe that's not the number one priority for new development. And so by looking at these operational metrics, we can be data-driven in how we approach the 
management and the ongoing development and the life cycle of our Power BI solutions. So with that, I'll open it up for any questions from the group. And uh, to give people time for questions, I'll also just put up contact information again. But as I mentioned at the beginning, these slides and all of these links will be available. Brent will be posting those at some point in the near future to the user group site. So you'll have all of this available, all of the slides as well as the notes that are included in the slides. And if there are no questions, I'll turn it back over to Brent. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, yeah, it's really good. A lot of those pages are hidden back there. The refresh summaries and the uh, I actually had not even tried the usage uh, metrics report new experience. It looks like they're they're building in some like on page type of analytics, which is which is cool. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely want to take advantage of some of that that new stuff that's there. And um, and like you said, I mean, a lot of us would know how to open up Power BI Desktop. If you look a little bit at the APIs, you could probably connect to it right from Power BI Desktop and pull in some data and build some, some useful reports right there on the spot. So um, yeah, thanks a lot for your presentation. And uh, just wanna thank everybody else who came and, and was here today. And we will uh, see you again April 20th. But please don't forget if you if you'd be willing to share. I know Greg does a really good job with presentations, so, but don't. <laughs> but you you too would do a great job with presentations. Just coming as a as a user group member and saying, hey, here's what I've been working on lately, and I thought you all might want to see it. So thanks all for your time, and we'll go ahead and wrap up there since it's uh, 1 p.m. Central. Have a great day. Thanks very much, all. Appreciate thanks, spending Greg. some time with you today.